So continuing on with our lecture, we have the properties of water. Then we'll wrap up this section by talking about acids and bases. So this is a list of the properties of water, and we're going to go through each one of these individually. So water is polarity. Water is a polar molecule. If we want to draw out the structure of water, H2O, that's two hydrogen and one oxygen. Our oxygen goes in the middle, and then we assign electrons like we've talked about before. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six because oxygen has six valence electrons. Now these two are bonded together, these two are kind of together here, but these are free to form bonds. So we will draw our hydrogen with each one of their electrons. And then we just play connect the dots. So there's a bond that forms between that oxygen and hydrogen and a bond that forms between that oxygen and hydrogen. So that's the structure of water, and you can see that depicted down here. Now overall, this oxygen is pulling electrons toward it. So this oxygen has an overall negative charge. The hydrogens, because they're almost on the verge of giving up these electrons, even though they are shared because it's a covalent bond, these end up taking on an overall positive charge. Due to the fact that water has opposite charges within the molecule, water is a polar molecule. So water, you can see here, if we were to dissolve sodium chloride, the sodium ion forms over here, the chloride ion forms over here, and sodium chloride is an ionic bond, so just a reminder of how ionic bonds work. Ionic bonds are just held together because opposite charges attract. So we've got our sodium and our chloride near each other because they happen to be oppositely charged. But when dissolved in water, the hydrogen end of things, which has a positive charge, interacts with the negatively charged chloride ion. And sodium over here, the positively charged sodium, will interact with the overall negatively charged oxygens. Now these don't have a true positive and negative charge, so these charges aren't real charges. They're just poles, and this is known as electronegativity. So oxygen has this electronegativity pull of electrons, but they are sharing them, so we can't assign this a true negative charge and a true positive charge. But it's the overall trend in how water can be a good solvent, so it dissolves substances. The three phases of water, so we have a solid, which is ice, liquid, which is water, and gas, which is steam. One of the major things you'll notice about water that's different from the other elements is that, or the other molecules, is that water in its solid phase is less dense than water in its liquid phase. That's why ice floats, and it's extremely important for ecosystems. These are actually two properties of water. So they say that water has six properties. We just went through um, the polarity and the phases of water and how ice is less dense than the liquid water. High heat capacity and high heat evaporization, those are two separate properties, but we'll just lump them in together because this graph kind of shows you um, some common trends here. So water has a high heat capacity. What that means is that it takes a lot of energy in order to change the temperature of water. If you ever go swimming in the ocean in the middle of summer, it's usually colder water. Now, if you go swimming in the ocean in the middle of winter, it's usually warmer water. 
Why is that? Well, it takes so long for the water temperature to change that is due to the high heat capacity. This is why those people can jump into Lake Michigan and you can almost see the lake steaming sometimes. That's because it takes such a long time and it takes so much energy, energy to change the temperature of water that usually water temperature is, uh, varies as opposite with the seasons. Heat of vaporization. So vaporization is talking about evaporation. If you ever think about evaporation, that's when water turns into its gaseous state, it turns into a steam and it evaporates off of a surface. It's a high heat of vaporization, which means it takes a lot of heat in order to vaporize. This evaporation though, allows for animals to cool themselves off. So here you can see an elephant that's spraying itself with some water. When the water molecules go away from the animal, they are dragging with them heat and they're uh, allowing the animal to cool off. And this is evaporative um, sweating. This is what we do all the time. So if you sweat, it's evaporative cooling. That water will hold that heat temperature and take it away from the body. Cohesive property. So cohesion has to do with the ability of water molecules to interact with each other or to stick to each other. The cohesive property of water allows for insects to walk on the surface of water. This gives water its surface tension. Water's adhesive property allows it to stick to other surfaces. So here you can see a capillary tube going into liquid. The water is actually going to get drawn up the capillary tube because water has a tendency to want to stick to the surfaces of the capillary tube. And by sticking, it's going to adhere to the surface and that draws water up into the capillary tube. So now that we've talked about the main properties of water, we're going to go on to talk about acids, bases, and buffers. So the pH level is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. So we have these hydrogen ions and we have the hydroxide ions. And when you have excess hydrogen ions, that's considered an acid. And when you have an excess hydroxide ions, that's considered a base. When we name acids and when we draw out their molecular formula, um, I'll give you an example of one, like hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. We know it's an acid because the name actually starts with an H. Carbonic acid, H2, or we'll do sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So with this one, again, we know it's an acid because it starts with an H. Now bases like sodium hydroxide have that OH in them, and that's how you kind of know that it's a base. But some additional properties of acids and bases. So we'll start with an acid. So we already said that an acid has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. This means that the acid has a low pH, so it's a pH of less than 7. Acids will turn litmus paper red. A litmus paper is a type of paper that's designed to change color in response to the level of acidity or alkalinity. So an acid turns it red in color. Acids are usually sour tasting. And examples of acids include like the hydrochloric acid that makes up your stomach acid. Lemon juice is another example of an acid. Now bases. Bases have a low hydrogen ion concentration and a high hydroxide ion concentration. They have a high pH, so a pH of greater than 7. They're usually slippery feeling and many soaps are considered bases. Bases turn litmus paper blue. So all of those characteristics that I just labeled off, 
you should know all of them. So if you didn't get a chance to write them all down, rewind the video and write them all down, you will need to know these for um, exam questions and quiz questions. So the pH scale is used to indicate the acidity or basicity, also known as alkalinity, of a solution. So right here at 7, 7 is neutral. Anything less than 7 is an acid. And anything greater than 7 is a base. And here's some examples. Here's a variety of different acids. And then you have distilled water, which is completely neutral. And then you have a variety of bases. So what is a buffer? A buffer is a substance that prevents a change in pH. Buffers can donate and accept hydrogen ions. And this allows them to prevent a change in pH. But there's a certain limit to their buffering capacity, and that's what it's called, their buffering capacity. So at a certain point, they're no longer able to perform this buffering. But they do a pretty good job keeping a steady pH, especially in living organisms. So the health of, health of organisms requires maintaining the pH of body fluids within narrow limits. Human blood is usually uh, about pH 7.4. So we have 7.35 to 7.45 is average, and so 7.4 is right be between there. If the blood pH drops below 7, acidosis results, patient slips into a coma and could potentially die. If the pH rises above 7.8, alkalosis results, the patient starts, um, again, slipping into a coma and could die. Acidosis usually causes uh, hyperventilation. So you start breathing really fast, like crazy, to cr try to get that um, carbon dioxide out of the body because usually it's due to an excess of carbonic acid that's built up. Alkalosis causes shallow breathing, and that can both of those can result in you know, life-threatening situations. The body has built-in mechanisms to prevent pH changes. For example, Carbonic acid buffer dissociates and reforms to reduce changes in pH. Now I'm going to pull up something here. And just talk a little bit about amino acid structure. So an amino acid has this basic structure. You have this carbon, which is attached to a hydrogen here. Then you have some type of R group that makes that amino acid unique. Then you have this NH2 amine group, which is how it gets the name amino acid. And then you have this COOH carboxyl group. Every amino acid has the capability to serve as a buffer. Well, how is that? Well, this side of things can donate a hydrogen. So this side kind of serves as the acid side. Well, this side of things can accept a hydrogen. and then that will become NH3+. Plus. So this is known as the base side. So if in the body the pH starts to get off, every amino acid can either start donating hydrogens or accepting hydrogens in order to maintain an internal consistency. And this happens within every cell inside of your body. So if we can maintain that pH to the greatest extent that we possibly can, we can do that using just our amino acids. But of course there's additional buffering systems in the body, like the phosphate buffer system, um, the carbonate buffer system, or bicarbonate buffer system. So there's other mechanisms that exist. I just wanted to go through this one to give you a little more insight on protein structure, amino acid structure. We will be coming back to this structure of amino acids later on in the semester.